I actually stops sharing that screen. Okay, well, hi, welcome to everyone today. Uh, we're in for a real treat. So very well, warm welcome to you all for this exciting online conversation. What really counts? Women speaking out. This is the first in the Women's Climate Congress online series for 2022. And this event is actually part of the National Sustainable Living Festival 2022. And we're very excited to be part of the festival and thank the organisers very much for including us. Today we have our very own Women's Climate Congress founder, Dr Janet Salisbury, and the two Janes, Jane Caro and Jane Gleeson White. Speaking today and we're in for a treat. My name is Barbara Baking and I'm a founding member of the Congress and your host for today. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we're meeting today and the land that was never ceded. In Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri's peoples. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So wherever you are around the country, please feel free to put your name and the country on which you are in the chat for us. And we're going to open our conversation by going imaginatively to Currajong or Capitol Hill. That's in Canberra where Parliament House stands. And again, we acknowledge the elders of the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people. They tell us that Currajong Hill is a women's place. And this image is by Canberra artist, Sally Blake. Our hearts and ears are also open to this place as a singing hill. 30 years ago, that's how Canberra artist and prehistorian Dorothy Cameron experienced it when she visited Parliament House for a women's meditation group, along with the then Western Australian Green Senator, Joe Valentine. Let us, like those women, close our eyes, feel the earth beneath our feet and open our hearts and our views and listen to this beautiful piece by the first of all. The ancestors are here. Women are singing. The hill beneath us is singing. magic piece. Glenda Lockley passed the story on to us last November during Women Rising, our first National Congress Day. Her video presentation was created as Glenda as a storyteller and composer for a chorus of women whose voices are directed by Johanna McBride, visual artist Sally McBride, so, sorry Blake, sorry, and sound magician Danny Blake, Danny Pratt. In the chat, you'll find the 10 minute video of the inspiring story of the swing singing hill and beautiful art prints of Sally's images for sale and all proceeds go to benefit young artists. And I'd certainly encourage you to go and have a look because it's magic. It's just over two years since the Women's Climate Congress commenced and so much has happened since then. 
And as you can see, this is a regular Zoom meeting rather than a webinar because we want to feel a sense of connection to all your wonderful participants out there. And please keep your sound on mute and it's up to you whether you keep your video on or not. We recommend that you keep the setting on speaker view so that you can see the person who's speaking on full screen. So just a few housekeeping things. In a moment, I'll introduce Janet and she'll introduce our two women speaking out today, Jane Caro and Jane Gleason White. But during the conversation, we invite you to um, provide questions in the chat and some comments along the way as well. I'll also be the guardian for the process. Keep an eye on the time and review your questions in the chat for the Q&A and put as many as possible to the panel. This event is being recorded and we will circulate a copy of the recording to all those participating. We will record on speaker view so you should not appear. But if you want to be doubly sure, just turn your video off. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Janet Salisbury. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you online here this morning for this event. So the chanting is beginning and the humming has begun. I so love that image. Or to quote the theme of our National Congress of Women event last November, women are rising. On the Singing Hill video, when you go to the link that is now in the chat uh, after this event, uh, you will hear former Senator Joe Valentine read Dorothy Cameron's prophetic poem, The Singing Hill, as she read 30 years ago in the Senate. Some of the words go, with the passing of the seasons, music from the Singing Hill will transcend the voices of the dark suits shouting their abuse. The shouting will be stilled, the healing of the planet will begin. And the daughters of a different dreaming will recover the mystery, rediscover the harmony of the centre of the circling around the Singing Hill. We're pretty sure we can hear the rising, chanting and humming spirit of women today. This has been seen in the March for Justice movement, calling out misogyny and sexual abuse of women in our institutions, workplaces and the community. It's seen in the Women for Election movement led by Alicia Heath, who spoke powerfully at our National Congress event last November, and which has seen a quantum leap in the number of women elected to local government in the New South Wales elections at the end of 2021. And the many women now standing for election at all levels of government, including the many community independent women standing in the upcoming election. It's also self-evident in the First Nations women who we have heard from in our Congress journey to date and who so inspire us with their teaching about their cultural approach to collaborative governance, where women and men have equal complementary roles in decision making. But we're not quite there yet in relation to the widespread calling out of abuse towards the planet, Mother Earth, and the imbalance in the policy agenda that is still hugely dominated by a male lens defined, refined and set in stone over centuries. We think it is time for the blinkers to come off and for women, uh, for women trying to fit into the adversarial system that we did not design. And the election this year is already shaping up to have two big issues, climate change and gender. So it's a now or never kind of moment. In the Women's Climate Congress, we're building a diverse network of women from all political persuasions with a vision that with women's leadership, transcending the party politics that has held back unified national action, we can get us back on track to climate balance by 2030 and that women and men can work together to prioritise life on earth and the safety of future generations in all policy decisions. And hopefully maybe our vision statement link will be in the chat and I do encourage you to have a look at that. It's got some beautiful aspirational ideas in there. Uh, so to help us find our voices in this election year, we have two amazing guests today. Well-known broad broadcaster and social commentator, Jane Caro AM, who is known for her outspoken views on the need for more women's leadership around action on climate change and other social issues. And regular commentator on economics and sustainability, Jane Gleason White, 
with his Griffith Review article last year entitled Erasure, and the summary of this published in The Guardian in August 2021, titled What Really Counts? How the Patriarchy of Economics Finally Tore Me Apart, prompted much discussion among our members and has informed our theme for today of What Really Counts? Women Speaking Out for Change. So fuller bios of Jane and Jane are on our website and Nettie's going to put the link in the chat. Then I will say a bit more about each of these two women as we go along. And because we've got two Janes, you might find me referring to Jane G and Jane C. I hope you will be able to hear the difference. So I'm going to turn now to our two guests. And in the first round of questions, um, I'm going to, to ask them really what gets you going when it comes to speaking out. And I'm turning first to Jane G. Uh, Jane, your books, Double Entry, about the history of double entry accounting and the six capitals have both been bestsellers in the economics and financial spheres. In six capitals, you propose four additional accounting entries in addition to the traditional financial measures, natural, human, intellectual and social relationships. These six capitals have been widely incorporated into integrated reporting frameworks across business and other areas of governance. As I've mentioned, our theme today of what really counts is a reference to your Guardian article last year. And this article is based on a, the longer piece you wrote for the Griffith Review, in which you talk about the erasure of women's voices and you challenged yourself to revisit the language of capitals, both in practical and, ge and gendered ways. In the article you say, in its current state, mainstream economics is failing to address the many critical issues of our times, including gendered and racial violence, climate change, inequality, poverty, hunger, species extinction, ecosystem destruction, land theft and the privatisation of water. You also say, after 10 years of writing about capitalism, I saw that the erasure of women is not only palpable, it's bound to my own flesh and blood. Can you tell us a little bit more about this blinkers off moment that you refer to about the failure of mainstream e economics to address these critical issues and how this is related to the erasure of women? Uh, thank you so much, um, Janet, for that introduction and question. And it's really nice to be here. I'm very honoured. Thank you for asking me. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the um, custodians of the land on which I'm speaking, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, you started the, your sort of introduction by asking what gets our blood boiling or whatever you said <laughs> and everything you just read then gets my blood boiling. <laughs> I think there's, there wasn't one particular moment, but there was absolutely one moment that clarified for me a line in the sand. Um, and I talk about that in my essay, which is the moment on Wall Street, I was invited to sort of keynote really a conference at the New York Hedge Fund Roundtable, you know, which to me is the epitome of capitalism at the heart of capitalism. Um, and they had read my book and had been open to the idea of these new capitals. So including environmental and social measures within traditional economic measures. And on one of the panels, there were two like, huge heavyweights I'm talking you know besties with Al Gore and you know like the serious heavy weights of global finance speaking about very very excitedly about this exciting new investment opportunity which they were calling blue gold and I was you know so intrigued and fascinated because I hadn't heard anything about this and as they spoke I realized because they never really called it by its real name that they were talking about water and I just thought at that moment, I, you know, like I, it was like I had an existential crisis in that second. Um, and I sort of reeled through the rest of the day. And I just thought I can no longer speak this language. If that, if this precious, essential, life-giving, not even a resource, you know, entity being um, is being called blue gold, then 
I'm out of here sort of thing. I didn't know where I was going to go, but but I should also sort of um, credit George Monbiot for first planting seeds in my mind with his brilliant writing in 2014, especially on the implications of ecosystem services and ecosystem offs offsetting. So, you know, to put my experience in a broader context, because I came to this through a very traditional economic paradigm and through the traditional system that I'm now, you know, rejecting, um, it seemed completely logical that the way to include these measures would be through the language of capital you know, because that is the natural progression. If this is the dominant paradigm that governs the global economy and policy, then everything must be in its language, which is the language of capital. So I just followed that logic. But a regular human outside this narrative thinks it's completely spurious and nonsense, like um, George Monbiot and most other people on earth. I think it was just because I was so trapped in it, which is why I began to see it was a problem with language and theory. So, you know, it's a very strange place to be in to both understand that system and to want to think beyond it. And I feel that my last two essays for Growth Review, the um, one in 2019 called Valuing Country and the one an Erasure, have been my attempts to kind of think beyond it in terms that aren't economic. Because that list of things that you mentioned that economics is failing to address, of course, it's not economics job to to you know, solve those problems. I mean, economics has become so overblown in its sense of self-importance and our kind of reverence of it that we imagine, and it purports to solve all the planets of the earth. But of course, these are human and social and, and natural issues and they can only be solved by people in numbers. Um, so I guess that's sort of where I arrived at. I'm not sure if that particularly answers the second half of your question. Would you just remind me of that again, please? Um, and how is this related to the erasure of women? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, that was the most shocking thing, I think, for various reasons related to my own personal history. It was much easier for me to be animated and passionate about the erasure of nature, you know, something out there, than to kind of consider that I might have been erased at the same time in the same way. So it was really only being invited by Ashley Hay, the extraordinary editor of Griffith Review, to reflect on my disenchantment with economics and to do it in the context of gender, um, that I got to where I got to in that essay, which realized that because of my family history, which was very based in economics, uh, particularly my father, well, not particularly, my father's um, family, where all of them studied economics, him and his two sisters, um, and the fact that my aunt had been so brilliant and so exceptional and had been the first woman to win the economics medal at Sydney University, um, you know, in the 1950s and then had, or maybe it was the 1940s, and then had been excluded or prevented from having a career because she married a career diplomat and that she automatically had to give up her career, her brilliant career, um, and eventually had a lobotomy, you know, because she had so many breakdowns. That story somehow activated something in me that just made me realize okay and of course the extraordinary work of Marilyn Waring which I already knew but I understood it as kind of theory out here suddenly I understood it as something in myself and that's when I got really angry I feel I wrote that essay in pure rage and I did <laughs> submit it to Ashley Hay and said you know excuse me it's full of rage please feel free to take the rage out and she went no Jane the rage is what we want <laughs> so yeah so um, this is related to women because in exactly the same way that nature, you know, which I find a spurious term anyway, but let's just assume nature, this, in the exact same way that nature has been completely omitted from economic measures, so have women and women's work, and not through any accidental kind of oversight, but through absolutely active erasure. Women protested throughout the 19th century trying to get their work valued, you know, all those blue stocking feminists um, in the second half, in the Victorian era, tried to, you know, had serious arguments with, for example, Alfred Marshall, the so-called father of neoclassical economics, to advocate the value of this work. And so it was a series of decisions by men that actually erased it from economic measures. And for various reasons in 1953, that was sort of built into the global economic system that was created following the Second World War 
under the aegis of the UN and, you know, informed by the work of Maynard Keynes, who is a brilliant economist. But, um, you know, anyway, so this now automatically, it's like the default setting of the global economy and therefore, tragically, the default setting of policy because we've now sort of, you know, abrogated our responsibility to make actual ethical decisions to numbers, you know, profit, return on profits and, and economic growth figures. So I should probably stop there. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those points in a minute, but I want to turn now to Jane C. And Jane, um, I mean, we know that for the past 100 years since women got the vote, they've been fitting into a system and a workplace that wasn't designed by them and is not suited to our needs, our ways of working or our policy um, priorities. It's, and it seems that more change is needed than just adding more women as in equal numbers, quotas and so on. And you have been very outspoken about that in your various TV appearances on the drum, Sunrise, and, and also in your articles and your opinion pieces um, about needing more women than just equal numbers of women to overcome the current cultural sexism that prevents women's voices from being heard and their pr priorities represented a number of your books also deal with this theme. Accidental Feminists deals with the plight of uh, the current generation of over 50s women who all worked all their lives but then struggle with access to a home and pension. Unbreakable de deals with the challenges women have to overcome from sexual assault and so on. Can you talk to us a little bit more about just what you think women can bring to change the world and the barriers that we face? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> One of my favourite um, stories about the difference it makes having women not just at the table but in positions of power because the older I get, the more I have felt that power is the point. Now, a lot of women are very frightened of power. Oh, power is nasty, power is controlling, power is domination, power is bad. But power just means agency, just means actually ability to do something. Um, in other words, the best analogy I can think of is, you know, you turn on the power and the light goes on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> power is the point. So the best story I ever heard about that was, in fact, back in, um, I think it was around about the 1850s, 1860s, when chloroform and ether were, were first invented. And doctors hailed it as a boon for birthing women because the, um, as we all know, women have only uh, lived longer than men for about 100, 150 years. Prior to that, they died like flies in childbirth in agony. I mean, it was absolutely shocking. And um, so doctors were, this is great, a lot of the reason that women would die is because they would get exhausted from the pain and the length of the labour and adrenaline would kick in, the labour would stop and they didn't have the kind of obstetrics and things like that to help that situation. So doctors went, great, we'll be able to reduce the pain of women in childbirth, we'll be actually be able to keep more women and children alive. Um, the churches, in their wisdom, went, oh, absolutely not. No, taking away the pain of childbirth, this is the punishment by God for Eve's original sin, that she should suffer and bring forth children in misery and pain and die, perhaps. Right to life wasn't a thing until they realised they could use it to oppress women. Um, big fuss, big palaver, except at that particular point in history, almost alone in the history of all those kinds of things, the head of the Church of England was herself a birthing mother at that time of about seven children, Queen Victoria. She went on to have two more. She heard about ether and chloroform and she said to the heads of her church, sod off, grabbed it with both hands and had her final two births with some kind of pain relief, therefore making it acceptable and fashionable for women to use pain relief in childbirth, therefore directly saving the lives of probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of women and children. And that is a really clear example of how lived experience informs what happens in power. And so I've always been of the belief that we can't keep asking nicely. 
we've been asking nicely for a very long time. We are so reasonable. I mean, Jane points out that, you know, women have been arguing probably politely with, um, you know, the men in power uh, for ever since economics was invented. And still they are raised us. They patted us on the head and told us, could you go get the sandwiches, love? Um, and we've put up with it. We've put up with it until incredibly recently. And I do want to refer to a moment in the last couple of weeks uh, when Grace Tame, um, you know, was at the ceremony to pass over her Australian of the Year title. I suspect some heads must have rolled for her getting that appointment. Um, but anyway, uh, she was there at the ceremony and she famously refused to smile at our Prime Minister and... Um, in fact, gave him one of the most brilliant moments of side eye I think I've ever seen, um, which has now turned into a meme and a T-shirt and a whole lot of things. And when I first watched that, I have to confess, I felt uncomfortable. As I watched it happening live in front of me, I was really uh, discombobulated and uncomfortable about it. And I was then I stopped and thought, why? Why am I feeling uncomfortable and really uneasy and tense and unhappy about her not smiling and being so stony. And I realized it was because I've been trained from birth to be nice, to smile, to be polite. You catch more flies with honey, you know, all the sorts of things that we were groomed to do. Clearly, I was not very good at learning that, but nevertheless, the message got in. And what Grace Tame has just managed to do is just smash it smash it into a thousand pieces by taking the power that was hers as Australian of the year and using it. And mostly we don't. Mostly if we get power, we don't use it. And we often don't use it on behalf of ourselves. Um, and we have to, because what we've been watching as long as we've had almost exclusively men in power and wielding power is a slowly unfolding disaster, which now leads us to a place where we have increasing inequality all over the world. And we are staring at the abyss of the annihilation of the ecosystem that supports us. And all of this comes out of the idea that um, all this stuff, including women, are there to kind of uh, be plundered and used by men. And of course, the more powerful, the more important, the more of a winner a particular man is, the more of the spoils of winning, which include women, uh, he can use and abuse. This has been a mindset for a very, very long time. And it is a misuse and abuse of power. And it's seen in small things, in domestic violence, in the lack of concern about the fact that the fastest growing group amongst the homeless is women over 55. These are mostly women who did what they were told. They're the, the girls I went to school with, they're my age, and they're the, they're the good girls. I was a bad guy. I was a naughty girl. I fought back and smoked up the back behind the toilets and flirted with boys. I wasn't a good girl. Um, these were the good girls. These were the girls who did exactly what they were told to do. They grew up, they um, went and worked as a secretary or, you know, had a job. I remember the ads. I'm a receptionist centre girl. It's the best, most interesting job in the world and about the most you can aspire to if you're a girly. And um, off they went and got married, had a couple of kids, all went to shit, but they mostly worked for most of their lives, poorly paid, casual employment, et cetera, et cetera. What was their reward for all their self-sacrifice, for putting the need to care for other people ahead of their own need to earn an income? Because if anyone needed care, small children, elderly parents, you name it, it was the women who stepped back because that was our duty as women. What's their reward for all that self-sacrifice? For the very real risk of spending the rest of their lives and their vulnerable old age living out of their car. And does anyone in a position of power care at all? No, they do not care. They're, these women are past their unit use by date. No one wants to fuck them anymore. What point are they? Let them live in their cars. Um, who cares? Uh, and it is despicable. It is disgraceful. And the only people who do care are women. And we have to take the power. 
We just have to. We can't keep giving it to them. They don't use it properly. Some do. There are some obviously lovely, lovely men who do the right thing and understand. But not enough of them do. Our turn. And some of us will be lousy and awful too, but that's all right. You don't have to be perfect. Just better. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Uh, I knew you'd sort of get us roused up. <laughs> That's really good. Um, and I do notice that um, uh, Lysia Heath, who I mentioned earlier, is, in, is one of our participants today, and she's put in the chat a link to the Women for Elections new campaign, which is called Power As You've Never Seen It Before. So I recommend that you go and check out that link and have a look. It's, um, yes, it's a wonderful expression of how we have to redefine power. And I suppose what we're wanting to think about is how can we turn things around? I mean, how can a, a movement like the Women's Climate Congress uh, help to sort of create this blinkers off moment for women? Like we're a nonpartisan organisation um, trying to bring women together to... Um, you know, challenge the system, I suppose, and to say we want to be able to have access to the policy agenda, not just not just to be there in numbers, but to. Well, somebody said to me the other day, we don't want to just be at the table; we want to rebuild the table. <laughs> so I'll turn back to Jane G for a moment and um, ask you um, maybe to follow up a little bit in this way. So I mean, I've thought about this issue of what really counts, but maybe that's a long, well, I don't know, in your, what really does count in relation to what, I suppose, what women can do to, um, to, to, to turn this around. What are the stumbling blocks? You refer to the language in your, the language of capital in your essay, uh, but I suppose I'd like you to take up the story, maybe thinking about what, what, what do we need to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yes, yeah, very rousing, Jane. I mean, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, well, one, I would actually like to smash the table and not rebuild it at all. I don't want any <laughs> tables. I want us all to be sitting on earth and remembering <laughs> that this, you know, and thank you for that beautiful introduction, Barbara, because that is the point. You know, I love that that um, hill that Parliament House is on is a sacred women's place. I find that incredibly hopeful and inspiring. Um, you know, so for me, yes, it is all about language. And I know it's a bit of a cliche now to talk about the narrative and we need a new narrative. Well, it certainly is in the in the world, in the circles I travel in, but I really do think that's true. And so I think the first thing that we have to do probably not just as women, but as a humanity is realize that numbers are spurious and that they are, you know, they can be made to say anything because we're still so enthralled to argumentation via the numbers, you know, via GDP or economic growth or profit. Um, so I, I, that's why I want to smash the table. Um, and in terms of what we can do as women now, I mean, I feel that what I did, and it was only last year, and it took me quite some time, several months to unpick my brain, is to just refuse, do a lot of, you know, do some grace tame. And, you know, as Jane C mentioned, I mean, I just think that's a perfect analogy. And I have to say grace tame and another young woman called Lucia Osmond Crowley, who's the, you know, speaker out of, or equally of um, sexual abuse. Um, they're creating new which I have found incredibly inspiring and just being badass and absolutely refusing to speak the language of men, including in gesture, you know, in our body movement, you know, like not smiling and being polite. So, uh, you know, that doesn't sound very constructive to talk about a huge, huge acts of refusal, but in the sort of wake of that, in the new space that opens up, there's so much amazing stuff going on. So for me, movements like yours are where it's at. I, I, this is not going to be some big homogenous new system that we're going to sort of invent that's going to guide us. It's every single... We each have to take responsibility for our own lives and our own part in this. Because as you say, Jane, we all have power. And power is just about agency. So I don't, I'm, I'm really happy that I don't have a kind of formula or a theory 
because they've proven to be so useless. So it's, it's, it's about gathering in communities and working from the ground up with no tables. <laughs> I, might, I might just follow up slightly on that, Jane G, before I turn back to Jane C. I mean, I just wonder whether, I mean, the language of the right and the left as well in political terms is, I find that can be unhelpful and in relation to, you know, I wonder whether women in the political system are sort of straight jacketed in their, um, in, well, I'm pretty sure they are. Um, and can we work together as women rather than identifying ourselves with particular, other, well, we can still have our other political, you know, persuasions, I suppose, but is there sort of, yeah, can we work together as women across those traditional parties? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And excuse me, I didn't say what does count. And to me, what counts is very, very simple. And it's the living systems of the earth, those yeah. that are creative and not destructive, you know, which we women are part of because we create life. You know, I think that's the fundamental fear men have, that we actually, women, are super powerful. We create new life. But I'm also talking about the living systems of the planet. So that's what counts. And relationships of care. And if we can sort of put that in front of mind, and as far as, you know, so I have, I guess, the liberty of thinking at the edge of these things, and I'm not in Canberra, you know, doing the hard yards day to day, you know, with power. Um, so I guess my thinking is very, is more iconoclastic than practical and pragmatic. But, you know, I mean, I think the two party system is dead, <laughs> I think. Our democracy is broken. Um, and in terms of working as women across the current political parties, um, I mean, I'm not really sure that that's something that I, um, you know, well, I certainly don't have experience in, and nor do I feel that I necessarily, that apart from holding in mind what really does count knowing at every moment every decision we make everywhere we speak that that's what's important and just not getting caught up in those spurious old stories about the economy you know I don't know what Jane Caro would add to that um, because I feel you've gone much more deeply into questions of power and politics um, whereas I'm more in the kind of I wouldn't say visionary but the kind of you know, the edges of where our thinking Overarching, is. bigger than yeah. politics. Yes. So Jane, pick up this theme and respond. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I, I do think we need we need politics. We, we, we've got to deal with the reality of power and how we wield it and how we get um, to hold some and to use it for good um, instead of evil. Uh, and, you know, I am I am both um, supportive of and cross with a lot of the women who currently have power. Um, I do like the new term that's being used, um, crumb maidens, for some of the women, um, particularly, I'm afraid, on the conservative side of politics, who are very much um, kind of softening the blows um, about superannuation, about so many other things. Um, and they're I understand it, and I think it was the way that women operated up until very, very recently, that we took what little crumbs we could get um, and turned those into a way to have some agency and some power. And we can blame women for doing that, but I actually think that's a way that women creatively lived within the society in which they found themselves. So I err on the side of compassion in terms of what women in previous eras and with different views of the world of mine have done. They've done the best they can in systems that were invented, as Jane Gleeson has pointed out so eloquently, deliberately to exclude them. So any woman who managed to get herself included has done an amazing job on at least one level because I am actually a huge fan of quotas. I do actually think that, I mean, I hate data, I'm not interested and I don't understand it, but... <laughs> Um, I get someone to write it in words for me so then I can tell what it means. Um, but I am a huge fan of quotas. And one of the reasons I'm a huge fan of quotas is I've gotten sick of waiting. I've gotten sick of the guys suddenly waking up one morning and going, oh, shit, we've been so unfair. Quick, let's give women half of everything we've got. I think if we keep waiting for that to happen, see you in a thousand years, we'll still be waiting for that to happen. Nobody gives up power without a fight. 
And quotas are, in a way, a way of fighting because there's two reasons that I think they absolutely should be instituted immediately. The first is um, we already have a world full of quotas and politically, uh, particularly a political system full of quotas. Um, look at any cabinet you care to name. If it's a coalition cabinet, um, this will shock you. Barnaby Joyce did not get to be Deputy Prime Minister of Australia through merit. I know it's a surprise, but it's true. He got there from a quota because the <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister of the Liberal National Party government is always the leader of the National Party, no matter what kind of a bozo the leader of the National Party may be. Um, other quotas in Cabinet, uh, they have to have people from this faction and that faction, this state and that state. Why are they not called quotas? It's what they are. Almost every board of directors will have various quotas that they have all the time. So it seems everyone's allowed to benefit from a quota except women. We're the only ones who aren't, not allowed to have quotas, very naughty. How could you do that? Everybody else has been promoted on merit. Look around you. Think of everyone you've worked for. Got their own merit? Hardly likely. Look at who dominates almost every position of power. Oh gosh, look at them all. They're all white, straight, private school educated men. Goodness me, if that's where merit lies disproportionately, someone should be doing a PhD on it. <laughs> um, and there may even be a Nobel Prize if they can prove why that particular um, configuration automatically bestows merit. Clearly it does not, but it is seen as merit or argued as merit. And then the final reason why quotas are really important and we need them and we've got to have them and we've got to fight for them, we've got to stop apologising for it and stop, you know, making excuses. Oh, no, 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 me. Stop it now. Um, is because men have forgotten, and so have we. That pesky 100% quota that operated in favour of men in every institution of power you care to name for at least 2,000 years, all the military, all the industrial and business complex, all the religious institutions, all the political institutions, education, um, any kind of rights at all over your own body, all 100% owned by men for at least 2,000 years and probably longer. And what are women seeking when they ask for quotas? Why? We're meek, 40, 50% at most. Frankly, I think the argument should be, blokes, if we're going even, Stevens, 100% for the next 2,000 years. And then we'll <laughs> because if we don't think that 100% didn't give blokes a leg up, and that's why they're in positions of power and we're not and that's why they deliberately erased us when they came up with the current economic and capitalist system if we don't think that's why they did it we are utterly naive that's why they did it it benefited them disproportionately so we have to be practical if we're actually going to make changes the feminist project is actually women Chipping away at that 100% quota. That's what it is. And now we're smart, starting to break it apart. And as you will have noticed, this is freaking the blokes out. The backlash is huge. It's scary. I think the whole Trumpist phenomenon, I think the um, right-wing macho um, resurgence is all about the fear of losing their automatic position at the top of the tree. Somebody once said to me, once, you know, a long, long time ago in the eons of unrecorded time, men made a deal with one another. And it was that some men could rule over other men as long as all men got to rule over women. And I think that that deal has been broken. And that's why you're often seeing men who feel a bit ma marginalised by our current system, particularly vociferous in their um, anti-feminist uh, feelings and rhetoric and behaviour because they are losing that little bit of um, privilege that they had by virtue of being male. That's a real feeling. I don't blame them. It's natural. It's understandable. But it's not right. And we have to fight back against that. So I think... I'm going to be practical. We all need to be saying we need quotas, but we're not after 50%. We're after whoever deserves to be there. And if that means 100% of women, 
we see, we still see 100% of men on so many organisations and we, nobody blinks an eyebrow and says it's unfair. Well, some people do, but nobody listens to them. Um, why would it be so horrifying to see 100% of women in the Supreme Court or the board of a bank? When we get there, we're getting home. Thank you. So we're getting towards that time when I'm going to ask Barb uh, Bakey what, what's coming up in the chat so that we can follow up a little bit what people are raising. Um, Barb, can you, can you can unmute yourself, I think. Yeah. Well, there's some really interesting stuff in the chat and it's been really, um, really fantastic hearing the two Janes and, and Kimmy and I in the chat. Um, and I've got some specific questions for both of you. Um, starting Sorry, with... I, I, you have to excuse me for one second. No problem. I'll start with you, Jane G. <laughs> um, how do you feel about circular, and this is from Sarah Pierce, sorry. How do you feel about circular um, economic and donut economic models gain, gaining traction and heavily invested, invested in the present? So how do you feel about that? Um, so that's a great question. And I should quickly add, um, I don't dispute um, the fact that politics is important. It's just not my area of expertise. So I do think it's hugely important. Um, I really love the circular economy thinking. Um, and I have actually spent a lot of time talking to Kate Rayworth, who is the sort of conceiver of donut economics. And I find it, a, it it's an, I know that it's been hugely inspiring for people um, in boardrooms and especially in the UN and <clears throat> the UK where um, ideas of environmental and I guess gender equality and other issues that seem still spurious in Australia are much more um, central. <clears throat> so I, I, I feel that um, the donut economics model is more like just a vision that it's good to work towards. It's not very practical. Um, it doesn't really help you get there, but it's just brilliant to have that as a kind of vision. Whereas I think the circular economy thinking, I know they're related, um, but that seems to me incredibly powerful. And there's a really interesting um, project in Cowra. I don't know if you're aware of it. You probably are, it's quite famous now, uh, where they're trying to create a circular economy. In other words, an economy that uses all its waste that you know is sort of intact. And the beautiful thing about what that has meant is that it's forced otherwise disparate groups of local citizens like farmers, town people, um, politicians, um, councillors to all sit together in a room and sort of thrash out what's important to them. And to me, that is where change is happening and that's where the revolution is happening. So yeah, I, I, I love circular economy ideas. Fantastic. And uh, moving on to you, Jane C., there's actually an appreciation for you being a naughty girl, but apart from that. <laughs> um, what? There should be more of it. Women have been too good for too long. I know, I know. Um, now, and this is from Emily, Imre. Um, now globally, more women are getting into positions of power. Do you think they actually have power to affect change or do they still under the power of men and the societal structures, even in their positions? And Leisha Heath did did suggest too that we need a critical mass of women as well so yes i think that's right we need a critical mass the one woman hung out to dry um it will be a kind of lightning rod for all our ingrained prejudices and um and uh arrogance really i did an article uh, after donald trump ran um i looked at this um tendency for people to say that hillary clinton should be locked up and that really interested me that that was the response, that she should actually be jailed. I mean, whatever you think of Hillary Clinton, um, why her? Um, and so I was really interested in our attitudes towards women who seek power. Because what I noticed was Hillary Clinton, when she was Obama's Secretary of State, was the most uh, popular woman in America. She had a 69% approval rating. And then when she decided to stick her hand up and um, run for office herself, um, she was plummeted, hated, the most hated woman in America. Sorry, same woman. Somebody's too I see, seeks power for herself. She's loved, she's hated. 
Julia Gillard. When she was Kevin Rudd's um, deputy prime minister, loved. When she went to be prime minister herself, hated, stabbed him in the back, bit, bitter bitch, tra traitor, betrayer, hate, hate, hate. So I investigated this. And what I found was that of the tiny number of countries that have had women leaders in the last 50 years, only 10% of countries have had one woman leader or more than one, but most have only ever had one. 25% of those female leaders have been investigated for corruption, accused of corruption, or actually jailed for corruption. 25%. Now, I'm not saying all of them weren't corrupt. Maybe some were. I don't know. But is, do we really think it's realistic that 25% of a handful of women who actually led countries were so corrupt that it's the only thing anyone remembers about them? Or is it that we automatically believe that a woman who seeks power for herself must be a bad woman? Because we assume that women's job is to nurture others. We are meant to help other people achieve, not to dare achieve ourselves. And we hold that belief as deeply as men do, that somehow we should apologise if we win a prize or if we uh, get to the top of something or if we seek promotion. We are supposed to be ashamed of that. There's a big pressure on women, if they want to get ahead in a particular area, to bring other women with them. Well, yes, that's a really great thing, and it's wonderful if women do that, and I certainly like the idea of you should reach down and help others up. But should that be an obligation, and should we regard them as hateful if they don't? And do women have to be perfect before they're allowed to have power? With no weakness, never make a mistake, never put a foot wrong, never be venal or selfish or, you know, take something that perhaps they shouldn't take. Look at Zali Stegel all over the papers today, you know. What was probably a mistake by an amateur um, group of volunteers trying to get someone elected uh, is now being used as she's a hypocrite. Look at that. You can't trust women because we're not allowed to be fully formed human beings, which means we get things wrong. We're not always perfect. We make mistakes and sometimes we're downright nasty and venal and want things for ourselves. Well, that's bad, but it's no worse than when a man does it. People say to me, oh, I'm so disappointed in her because she's a woman and she did that. And I always say, no, be as disappointed as if a man did it. As soon as we're more disappointed if a woman is human, then that means every woman carries this burden of you better be perfect, girly, or don't try to get to the top because everyone will hate you, including other women. So we have to allow ourselves to be lousy, to be not very good, and still allowed to aspire to have decent lives, to get ahead and to contribute our talents. That's it. Thanks very much for that, Jane. And that sort of leads on to, um, I'm going to combine a couple of, well, actually three questions together. Um, one um, was from Karen Bates and the other was from Natalie um, Doran Brown and then the others from Leisha Heath. So I'm sort of bringing them together. And what they were talking about was um, uh, leadership positions and, and um, being in organisations where they're not promoted or, or um, you know, they don't want to go into that male dominated one because they're the only, you know, perhaps the only female and get bullied and, and carry on. And then sort of following on from that, Leisha's question was, well, how can we all better help women recognise the power we already have and translate that into public office? And, and, and you know, um, Karen was sort of saying, you know, I need help and courage to, to step up with this and these talks help really help but what can you know what are some practical things that you know we can do as women to help other women and ourselves to step forward can i ask that quickly mm -hmm. forgive uh, ourselves for not being perfect and forgive one another for not being perfect because we're taught that we have to be and when we're not we feel so that's why we need courage to get ahead because we're so scared we'll be judged. We will be judged. But as long as we don't judge ourselves and accept the judgment as accurate because we have made a mistake or we were selfish or we did do the wrong thing or we were lazy that day, who cares? Um, until we can do that and then we are able to, to accept that failure and humanity of other women, 
we will constantly be battling our own judgment of ourselves and the inner critic. And that holds us back most powerfully of all. Forgive ourselves. And Joan, G, have you got anything to add to? Um, I mean, it's not really, again, my area, um, but I'll maybe just add a sort of personal note that, you know, I was also a bad girl at school and, you know, was sent out and smoked at the back and, you know, was sent to boarding school and <clears throat> things. But um, so, and I've, you know, been very um, rebellious in my thinking and, you know, my work and completely, you know, Pay, you know, like my career has been very eccentric, shall we say, but the, I was so shocked to find my writing this essay, Erasure, how much my brain had been kind of um, trained by simply studying a discipline that was governed by men, economics, to kind of default to the sort of thinking that, that Jane is saying we must rebel against. Yes, I'm not sure if that's frozen. Um, can, I, can I just pick up on that a little I bit? I was just going to pick up on that a little bit because over this conversation series, we've heard, had some talks from people who have working in the area of compassion, bringing more compassion into public life. And then also we had a talk from two climate, young women climate scientists who talked about a kindness in science movement. And in that we, we talked about what we could do with the kindness in politics movement. And, um, and actually in the UK, there is something called a movement called compassion in politics. And there's a number of uh, MPs uh, have signed up to that from all parties and looking for a more compassionate politics. And I think there's, there's, these are qualities that women bring, and, but we often sort of think we bring them, but then we back off again because we're told, oh no, no, that's not really the thing to do. But interestingly, um, Mary, Dr. Mary Graham, the First Nations leader for the University of Queensland, if you ever get a chance to listen to any of her talks, do please go because she's wonderful. She speaks wonderfully about First Nations governments and in relation to their philosophy, Western philosophy. Um, and one of the things she talks about is the law of obligation. And that is about trying to create policies, which, which is what in First Nations people do, um, that are for the common good you know that your obligation is for the good of everything and that's not just people that's the earth and everything and she's made an interesting comment a couple of times which is that women embody the law of obligation and that's the words that she's used that because we experience birth and death and regeneration through our bodies and i think that is something that is recognized in first nations women's business and it isn't recognized and we all and women often recoil from it or step back from it because this other lens is so prevalent and we feel like we have to fit in um and and i kind of feel that's the very lens we need to bring in relation to climate change and this big emergency that we're in at the moment yeah i mean that sort of goes to the end of my essay when i was trying to sort of clarify how we should rethink things, which is exactly about valuing relationships of care, which is sort of what you're talking about and what you're talking about, Jane, I'm, I fully agree about compassion and just putting that at the center. And so what you're really talking about are ethical questions and human questions. And I think they're the most important in this whole conversation that we have to take, you know, the power of our ethical to be powerful and important. Hmm. I think um, too, Jane when you accept yourself mm -hmm. and your weaknesses, and in fact, I've learned to actually really like my weaknesses. They're the best bits of me. They're the bits that save my sanity. <laughs> when, um, when you uh, accept that, you don't need courage anymore. Courage only comes, I, you only need courage when you are in a way doing something that is against your nature or you feel that there's something not quite real or, Vulnerable. and also you're terrified that you'll be judged and put down and then you'll feel bad about yourself once you accept that you're not that good <laughs> you know, and you'll stuff up and you won't get it right and you're not you don't have to save everything and everybody in the world and you know always be virtuous and always have considered everything and all of that once you accept that you don't have to do that that's not your obligation 
Oh, and you're much harder to, yeah, you're much harder to damage and you're much harder to frighten because if someone says to you, well, you were wrong, you go, yeah, yeah, sure. I've been wrong. I've been wrong heaps of times and I'll be wrong again. So what? Can we move on? Um, who cares? What's so good about that? You want to pull my fingernails out for being wrong? <laughs> I, don't care. I don't care. Um, so it's, and I think that's one of the burdens women have been battling with. And so I'm a little bit allergic to a saying that women bring something special or we embody something, or we're not necessarily, this is not true, but that knowing how we've been groomed and trained, the tendency is for us to then take that on as another burden that we have to live up to. And I actually want to go through a period where we say to women, nah, don't bother with any of that. You know, do what you think is right. Say what you believe in. Do what you're capable of without exhausting yourself and without destroying your family life and without killing yourself or destroying your health and get some pleasure. You're allowed to have as much pleasure as you like. Um, all of those things, until we can say that, we won't be as effective as we need to be because we aren't being holy ourselves. We're playing this being, being a good girl game. And that's what I'd like to see us stop. And the rebelliousness is the rebelliousness is where creativity comes as well as revolution and change and rebelliousness is what women are going through now we are entering i think the era of female rebellion and that's so exciting to me absolutely and yeah and, um, there's i mean there's so many more questions i could put to you because but i think we're like out of time <laughs> and uh there was some comments about um uh we should we should all be grace taming <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rebellion. Yes. So um, the the conversations in the chat has been absolutely fantastic, and there's been some wonderful questions, which I'm sorry, I really just haven't had been able to get to. But um, yeah, so thank you so much for a fantastic discussion. I'll hand back to Jenna. Um, yes, and I have my thanks to thank you so much, Jane G and Jane C, the two Janes, for a wonderful, inspiring, and uplifting uh, um, and motivating conversation today. So we'll just do our little online oh, uh, round of applause. <laughs> and I just usually end with just, I'm just going to share my screen to show you a couple of slides uh, for our next events. Um, our next month is, uh, is sort of our International Women's Day event. Uh, we're going to be a little bit after the main event on Tuesday the 15th of March and we're going to follow up the UN Women's theme for International Women's Day this year, UN Women's theme I should say, which is cl changing climates, equality today for a sustainable tomorrow and I, I actually love that double entendre on the word climate, which, which is sort of inherent in the name of our organisation as well. We need to change the climate in order to change the climate. And I think that's what we've been talking about today. And we have two wonderful speakers next month. Victoria Mackenzie McHarg is the Strategic Director of Women's Environmental Leadership Australia. As an organisation has done a wonderful job giving leadership skills to many women over the years. And one of our own members, we're going to be showcasing our own Women's Climate Congress members in all their diversity in the coming months and this is Zol de Ishtar who's a long long-term social justice advocate uh, was at the Green and Common um, uh, protests uh, way back and she's an author and she's co-founder with the elders of the Kapalangu Aboriginal Women's Law and Culture Centre so I think that's going to be an exciting conversation um, and then, of course, hang on, doesn't want to take you to the next slide for some reason. No, so I'll just show you like this. Uh, so, that, and of course, we have our next uh, National Congress of Women event coming up, which is a whole day event on the on the twenty eighth of April, online event. And we're, our theme this time is weaving. How can we work together across difference to restore climate balance? And so that's, that event is open for registration. If you go to the website, you'll see it. And there's a sort of a initial program there. We're still working on the details of the program. And hopefully it's going to be just as an exciting and engaging day as our day one event was. And I have heard a little Dickie Bird tell me that Glenda Clockley and the group who made that beautiful Singing Hill video that we featured at the beginning uh, is in the process of putting another one of Dorothy Cameron's stories into another video, which will take up this theme for our day too. So that's something to look forward to as well. And 
just a reminder to finish that this is part of the National Sustainable Living Festival. We thank them very much for featuring this event in their festival. And I suggest you go to their website and see all the other interesting events that they're running. So with that, I will say thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to Jane and Jane and to Barbara for looking, for hosting us and looking after the chat. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>